Today we have finally gotten our hands on the 2018 Mazda 6 and this particular trim is the one that you've all been asking about, the all new 2.5 liter turbocharged signature trim. In my opinion, the Mazda 6 is hands down the most attractive mainstream sedan in America. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. 2018 does not bring us a complete redesign of the 6, however, but they do give us a significant refresh. So we get a tweaked front end that looks a little bit sharper, a little bit meaner, and we also get the new signature trim, which is what we're looking at here with things like real wood trim, improved leather, improved dashboard components, etc., to make this feel more premium. As I've said before, the mid-size sedan segment is changing in America because a lot of people are moving to compact crossovers instead of the traditional family sedan. And as a result, manufacturers are trying to attract a slightly different customer. That's definitely what we see in the new Camry and the new Accord. They've gone for a sleeker look overall, and they're definitely prioritizing handling and performance. The Mazda 6 has always sold on its handling feel, as well as the good looks on the outside of the sedan, but with the 2018 refresh, they're also helping to give us a healthy dose of performance with that new turbocharged engine. Obviously, the first thing you notice about the Mazda 6 is this very distinctive Mazda grille. This grille design, I think, works really well on a wide variety of different vehicle sizes and shapes. This looks good on the CX-3, it looks really good on the CX-9, and every Mazda sedan that they've ever applied it to. We get some slight tweaks for 2018, it's a little bit meaner, it's a little bit sharper. We have this large chrome bar that wraps from one headlamp module to the other. These are full LED headlamps in all trims now, including the base model. And if you get the top end trims, which is what we're looking at here, then they start rotating in the corner, so they'll actually steer with you. There are no fog lamps down below, but we do have front parking sensors. They're not as well integrated as some of the competition, and we have a radar sensor behind that large Mazda logo. We do have functional air vents on the bottom that help direct air around the front tires for better efficiency, and then we have this large and distinctive Mazda grille right there inside that opening. When this generation of the Mazda 6 first launched several years ago, it was already on the long side of the segment, and even though the competition has continued to grow and grow, at 191.5 inches long, this is still one of the longer options in America. And it's really obvious when you start taking a look at combined legroom, because even though, again, some of those other vehicles have stretched massively, like the new Honda Accord, this still has fairly competitive rear seat legroom numbers. Instead of the slab-sided styling that we find in many mid-size sedans in America, Moss decided to give this a little bit more character with the lines that you can see there. But they also decided to not slam the roof as low as some of the competition. So we actually have a little bit more window area than some of the more recent redesigns in this particular segment, although obviously not as much glass as the previous generation Honda Accord that helps rear passenger headroom. All trim levels sold in America get 225 with tires, front and rear, although the wheel size does change. We'll go into this in more detail in the drive section, but that tire size is wide for a base model, but actually a little on the narrow side for a top end trim. Because this is a refresh, not a redesign of the Mazda 6, the overall form of the sedan remains the same. So we get a style out back that's a little bit rounder than the front, especially right here around these tail lamp modules. The tail lamps feature amber turn signals, as you can see over there on that side, and the overall design reminds me a little bit of the Infiniti Q50, which is a good thing to be reminded of when you're talking about a mainstream sedan. We have a small spoiler grafted onto the top of the trunk lid. You can see the cutout for that Mazda logo right there, and of course twin exhaust tips at the bottom. Parking sensors in the back are integrated into the bumper, but like the front, they're not quite as well integrated as some of the more modern entries. Mazda has long had a reputation for building fun-to-drive vehicles. But fun to drive doesn't always mean fast accelerating, and that's been a problem in the Mazda 6 in its last incarnation. The base engine in this vehicle is a 2.5 liter four-cylinder engine producing 187 horsepower and 186 pound-feet of torque. That is a little low on the horsepower side compared to some of the competition's lower-end trims. One of the big reasons that Mazda has not put higher horsepower engines in some of their vehicles is overall fuel economy, because Mazda is a smaller manufacturer and they don't have any hybrids or plug-in hybrids or electric vehicles to offset government mandated fuel economy scores. So instead, they need to make all of their models more efficient in order to achieve the same goals. And that is what we see in the base Mazda 6. That's why it features a new cylinder deactivation system on that four-cylinder engine to help improve fuel economy. It is available with a six-speed manual or a six-speed auto, and the automatic is gonna give you the best fuel economy at 29 miles per gallon, which is actually very, very high in this segment, even though it is still a six-speed automatic. Then we have this new engine right here. It's a 2.5 liter turbocharged engine that we first saw in the Mazda CX-9. 
The turbocharged engine gives the Mazda 6 some much needed oomph, but like we see in other Mazda models, the focus for this engine wasn't necessarily acceleration performance. It was to give you a fun to drive driving nature while also giving you good fuel economy. And that's why power output comes in at 250 horsepower if you give this premium unleaded, 227 if you give it regular unleaded, but 310 pound-feet of torque, which is class leading in this segment. You'll find this engine standard in the Grand Touring trims and above, and it's mated only to a six-speed automatic transmission. Whether you run this engine on regular or premium unleaded, you should get about 26 miles per gallon according to the EPA. 26 MPG comes in just a little bit below some of the competition's high output engine options, but it is in the same neighborhood as the Camry and the Accord, and in real world driving this performs very similarly. Front seat comfort comes in at 8 out of 10 points for me. We don't have a four-way adjustable lumbar support even in this top end signature trim, which I do think is a bit of a pity because we're starting to see that in more and more mid-sized sedans in America. However, the overall design of the seat is still fairly comfortable. There's also a reasonable amount of headroom. I tend to prefer to sit in a more upright position. I still have about an inch of headroom left, and we do have a moonroof in this model. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a moderate range of motion. It's worth noting that the front passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat. It does not have a two-way adjustable lumbar support, and the seat bottom cushion does not move in the same number of ways as the driver's seat. So if you have a front passenger routinely in your vehicle and they want something more comfortable, you will need to look at a different vehicle. Moving into the back seat, I'm going to give this 8 out of 10 points as well. The main reason for that is that we have about one inch less headroom than we find in the Camry or the Sonata. Legroom seems to be what's focused on most in this segment for some reason, especially with the new Honda Accord, which is advertising a massive amount of rear legroom, but legroom isn't as handy if you don't have the headroom to back it up. And that's what we see in this vehicle as well. We have a generous amount of legroom, but my head is again touching the ceiling. Now, I can't fault the Mazda 6 for this too much because just about every mid-sized sedan in America has seemingly limited headroom these days because of the overall demographic shift in this segment. If I move all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, I still have about half an inch of legroom left with this front seat all the way back in its tracks. Now, like we've noted in some of the vehicles in this segment, the foot room does get a little bit tight down there because of the shape of the foot well itself. A nice touch in this top end signature trim is that the rear door panels are finished identically to the front door panels, which we'll look at in a bit. Rear seat passengers get a padded center armrest with a small storage cubby, and this is where Mazda puts the heated seat controls for the outboard seat positions. The rear seats fold, it's a 60-40 design, and it is level with the cargo area in the back. Sleek, attractive designs often come at the expense of cargo capacity, but Mazda's done a decent job at giving us a usable cargo area back here. We find 14.7 cubic feet of space, which is right about the Camry's level of cargo capacity, but two cubic feet below the new Honda Accord. This cargo area is shaped a little bit shallow, so you can see I can't put a 22-inch roller bag in that position and close the trunk lid, but it is very deep, so you can actually put one in here on its side and slide it all the way back there to the rear seats, and you could stack a decent amount of luggage behind it. If we lift up the load floor, we find a donut spare tire, and then you could put a small amount of cargo right there inside. This is also where you'll find the space to store tow hooks, cargo straps, and of course your tire iron. When it comes to our exclusive trunk comfort index, I'm going to give this 9 out of 10 points for a mid-size sedan. Even though this is a little bit smaller than the Accord's trunk, I like the way that they've hidden the hinges away. We also have a very handy handle right here to help you close the trunk lid, and overall this is finished very well. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end signature trim. The moonroof is a pretty standard sized moonroof. You don't find a panoramic one in any version of the Mazda 6 yet. We have high adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and the front passenger and two-way adjustable headrests. The upholstery in the model that we're driving is sort of a walnut brown. We have an accent strip that's metallic right there in the middle of the seat back to dress it up a little bit more. And these seats are heated and ventilated. You can see we have perforations right there in the center of the seat back. You'll notice that the front seats are not as heavily bolstered as some of the entries in this segment, but they do a decent job of holding you in place on your favorite mountain road. As we see in most of the competition, the front doors are made from soft plastics on the upper portion of the door and hard plastics on the lower portion of the door right there around that bottle holder. Taking a closer look at the door, you'll notice something unusual for a sedan in this price category. And I'm not talking about this attractively designed door handle that integrates with that trim right there. I'm actually talking about the wood trim because the Mazda 6 in top end signature trim actually gets real wood. This is something we've seen in some of Mazda's new top end trims and it differentiates it a little bit 
from the Camry and Accord. Below that, we have a faux suede insert right there that is stitched. It's also brown to match the seats. And then, of course, the soft touch armrest below that and the bottle holder at the bottom. The faux suede trim continues on over to the dashboard, as does the real wood trim. It's a little bit more difficult to see it in this light. And then we have a soft touch upper section of the dashboard. There are a lot of different materials going on in this cabin, but I think everything works pretty well together. We have that faux suede right there. We have a small stitched section of material, and then we have the injection molded upper section of the dashboard. The glove compartment hasn't changed, so it is still a bin style compartment. It's a little on the small side, and I was not able to fit a tablet computer inside. In the center of the dashboard, we find the engine start-stop button, two large air vents, and the same infotainment system that we've seen in Mazda vehicles for a while. Mazda has been promising Apple CarPlay and Android Auto support on this system, but we have yet to see it. This is a touchscreen, like we see in some of the competition, but the touchscreen doesn't operate once the vehicle has exceeded a certain speed. So you have to use a controller in the center of the dashboard in order to actually control this screen once you're in motion. Although we don't have CarPlay or Android Auto, we do have a complete USB media interface and, of course, Bluetooth audio input. If you get the top end signature trim, then this display also gives us a 360 degree camera layout with dynamic steering lines right there. But it is worth noting that if we put the vehicle in reverse, for some reason, these lines do not rotate with the steering wheel. Continuing down the dashboard, we find more of that imitation suede trim, two-zone automatic climate control with the controls for our ventilated seats, heated seats, and of course, the heated steering wheel. Below that, we have a small static storage area where you could put your smartphone or other accessory, but there are no USB or power ports in that area. Moving below that, we find a pretty standard console shifter. We have a manual mode over here to the left, and then we have our sport mode button. This just toggles between normal and sport mode. Those are the only two we get. Continuing down from there, we find an electric parking brake, the button for the auto brake hold system. And then we have the controls for that infotainment system right here. Back button, music direct access button, home button, nav button, a favorites button, and then like BMW's iDrive, this toggles side to side, up, down, rotates around, and clicks down to enter. We then have a volume and power button on the right side. Between the front seats, we find a roller cover that hides the two large cup holders. I had no problem fitting large takeout drinks. And then behind that, we have a small padded armrest that opens to reveal a very small storage cubby. This is where we find two USB inputs, the auxiliary input, a 12 volt power port, the mapping database for that infotainment system, and as you can see, just barely enough room to fit a wallet and a smartphone inside. The sides of this area are also padded, so that way your arm has something nice to touch. Since we're driving the top end signature trim, we have the all new partial LCD instrument cluster. So we have a physical tachometer on the left, and then physical gauges for the fuel level and the engine temperature over here on the right. Making the LCD look a little bit more three-dimensional, we have a physical ring that is actually glued to the front of the LCD. This gives us things like our trip computer information, turn-by-turn -turn navigation directions, vehicle status, etc. One thing that I found interesting is that even though this is a color LCD, Mazda doesn't really use too many colors on this display, and they don't really offer much customization as far as the look of the overall display itself. The steering wheel is a three-spoke design, similar to what we see in other Mazda products. We have small sport grips up top and this large bottom spoke below. On the back of the wheel, we find paddle shifters down on the left and up over there on the right. The infotainment controls are over here on this side, volume up, down, and then we press in the center for voice command, the info button right here, which changes the screens on that multifunction instrument cluster, and then some dedicated phone buttons below. On the right side of the wheel, we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system. Mazda's new two and a half liter turbo is kind of interesting. Mazda not only ditched the sort of conventional wisdom in this segment by making this two and a half liters, not two liters, but they've also given this a massive amount of torque and at fairly low RPMs. Again, over 300 pound-feet of torque out of this particular engine. But when it comes to overall horsepower figures, this does fall behind some of the competition. 250 horsepower if you feed it premium, 227 if you feed this engine regular unleaded. In order to be as fair as possible, we made sure that this vehicle was delivered to us with a tank of premium unleaded in it, and of course, we refilled it with premium unleaded when we had to refill it as well. In our testing, this took 6.4 seconds to go from zero to 60. That is notably slower than the Camry and the Accord, which both did it in 5.7 seconds. That's because this engine doesn't produce as much power as the V6 that we find in the Camry, and remember that torque is nothing without horsepower behind it. The overall torque curve and horsepower curve of this engine are also a little bit different than what we see in the Honda 2-liter turbo, and of course, that Honda has more gears than this. It actually has four more gears in its transmission and a very, very aggressive first gear. 
I think the six-speed automatic transmission is what is hampering the zero to 60 acceleration in the Mazda. Mazda has been fairly upfront that they don't plan on increasing the number of gears in their vehicles for a while because they believe that six-speed automatic transmissions have the right number of gears for an engaging driving experience. And while I agree with that on the one hand, on the other hand, it does mean that this is still not going to be as fast zero to 60 as the direct competition. On the flip side, the massive amount of low-end torque that we have in this engine really improves drivability out on the road. There's not as much transmission shifting as there would be if this vehicle had a naturally aspirated V6, for instance, like the Toyota Camry, because you can just uh, climb these hills in higher gears thanks to that large amount of torque. It really does make driving a little bit more relaxed feeling. If you're thinking that sounds a little bit like a modern diesel engine, then you're right. Mazda's 2.5 liter turbo actually has kind of a diesel-like feel to it in that low-end torque. One of the other reasons that 0 to 60 acceleration is a little bit behind the competition is the tire size that we find on this vehicle. As I said earlier, all models have 225 width tires. And because of the amount of low-end torque that we have in this model, we get a lot of wheel spin. So it's actually difficult to get that low 6.4 second 0 to 60 score because if you just mash your foot on the throttle, it'll take longer because the front wheels are spinning. I suspect that if you put wider and grippier tires on the Mazda 6, then you could probably improve that 0 to 60 acceleration score by perhaps 1 to 2 tenths of a second. The tire choice in this vehicle also hampers the braking distance, because in our 60 to 0 braking test, this model took notably longer than the Camry or the Accord to stop, about 126 feet. That's 10 to 15 feet longer than top end trims of the competition, not only because of the tire size, but also because this vehicle is about 100 pounds heavier than some of those top end competitors. When it comes to overall handling, obviously those tires do have an impact as well. And in terms of overall grip, this comes in below the new Camry and the new Accord. Even though in original equipment form, this won't hold the road as well as the Camry and the Accord, I'm still going to give this an A when it comes to handling, because the overall feel of the Mazda is more engaging and just more fun. Obviously, every entry in this segment has electric power steering, but Mazda has done a reasonable amount of work to try and give us some feedback from those front tires. So it is a little bit easier in this vehicle to tell exactly what's going on up front. If I purchased a Mazda 6, I think the first thing that I would do would be replace the stock tires with grippier tires that were a little bit wider. You could likely fit 235 width tires on this vehicle without too much of a problem. And that really would help improve the handling. And I think it would actually make it handle better than the Accord and the Camry. Because as it is, even being 100 pounds heavier and having skinnier tires, this is still very, very close to what we see in the Toyota and the Honda. It would also help improve your braking score. On the downside, it would hurt your fuel economy. Even in the top end signature trim with the larger wheels and of course the lower profile tires, we still have a reasonable ride in the Mazda 6. This is a little bit firmer than I would say the average mid-size sedan in America and we can definitely feel more of the minor imperfections in the road because of the wheels and tires that are on this car. I think it's still a good balance. It still is comfortable out on the highway for longer journeys. Unlike top-end models of the competition, the Mazda 6 does not offer an adaptive suspension. So if that's something that you're looking for, you will need to shop elsewhere. When it comes to cabin noise, we measured 72 decibels in this cabin at 50 miles an hour, making this louder than the Camry, the Accord, and some of the other newer entries in this segment. That shouldn't surprise you too much, of course, because the basics of this vehicle have been around for a while. Even though this vehicle has slightly skinnier tires in the top end trims of the Toyota and the Honda, we actually get a little bit more road noise in this cabin than in those alternatives. So you should keep in mind that if you do plan on putting wider tires in your Mazda 6, that actually is likely going to be even louder than the model that we're driving right here. In terms of overall fuel economy, we have been averaging 26.5 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving. That is a little bit better than the Camry and the Accord, but again, keep in mind that we do have those skinnier tires in this vehicle. And if you were to put wider tires that would be the same size as those top end trims of the Camry and Accord, you're likely going to bring fuel economy down to about that same level. Mazda has been pretty dedicated to improving fuel economy in all of their mainstream models, and that's why the base 2.5 liter non-turbo engine gets nearly 30 miles per gallon combined. That's actually quite a good score for the power output that we find in that model, considering especially that it does not have a continuously variable transmission. A lot of other manufacturers, namely Honda, have been moving to CVTs in order to help improve fuel economy. And while they definitely improve fuel economy, they do take away a little bit from the driving experience. As much fun as the new Accord and the new Camry are out on the road, I actually think the Mazda 6 is just a little bit more fun. 
But again, fun does not necessarily translate into handling better, so that is something to keep in mind. It also doesn't necessarily translate into accelerating faster, because this is definitely going to be slower than the Accord and the camera. There's really not much you can do about that, although you could improve the handling again in this vehicle by swapping out the tires. Even though sales of mid-size sedans have been shrinking, this is still a pretty competitive segment, and we still find a great deal of standard equipment, even in base trims. The Mazda 6 is still one of the few vehicles in this segment that's also available with a six-speed manual transmission, and that helps lower its starting price down to $21,950. The reality is that very few shoppers actually want a manual transmission anymore, and that's why we don't see manual in any of the other trims of the Mazda 6. The reason we see a manual transmission available on the Honda Accord with its 2-liter turbocharged engine is easy to explain. They sell more Accords, so they're able to spend a little bit more money putting a manual transmission on that model, Mazda doesn't sell as many Mazda 6s, so there really wouldn't be enough to justify selling one with a manual transmission on that 2.5 liter turbo. Mazda has been pretty aggressive at putting their active safety package into more and more trims in their lineup, and they've now made it available in the base trim and standard in some of the mid-level and upper-level trims. That means that if you get the Sport for $23,000 for $625 extra, dollars, you could add the iActive Safety Sense package with radar adaptive cruise control, autonomous braking, etc. If you want manual lumbar support, you'll find that on the two-ring trim. You'll also find leather et seats on that particular model. If you want the turbocharged engine, that will first happen on the grand two-ring trim at $29,200. The next trim level up is where you'll find leather, power lumbar supports, etc. And then the top and signature trim is what we were driving with the fully loaded set of options and features, as well as that real wood trim. First up, let's talk about the Honda Accord. The Accord LX with the CVT is just a hair less when you consider that Honda Sensing is standard on that particular model versus the Mazda. At $23,570, you not only get that Honda Sensing system, but you also get the continuously variable transmission and a 1.5 liter turbocharged engine. It's a good deal and it is a little bit faster 0 to 60 than the 2.5 liter base engine in the Mazda 6. Although it is worth noting that the CVT is not quite as much fun. As I said before, the Accord Sport is kind of a different animal because they were able to put that 2-liter turbocharged engine and a 6-speed manual transmission in that model for $30,310. Now, whether you want to get the manual or the 10-speed automatic, it's going to be basically the same price for that trim level of the Accord. Now, again, the reason that Honda was able to do that in the Accord is that even though it is still going to be a very low take rate option, they sell enough Accords to make it worth the while. When you start comparing the Sport to the direct corollaries on the Mazda lineup, then the Mazda Active Safety Package becomes standard over there on the Mazda lineup. So overall value is actually quite similar, although you again won't find that manual transmission on the Mazda side. You also won't find Apple CarPlay or Android Auto on the Mazda. Mazda has been promising it and promising it, but we just haven't seen it yet. I think that the exterior of the Mazda is definitely more attractive than the Accord. Again, it's the most attractive in this segment in my mind, but I think that the interior in the Honda is actually a little bit better put together. Then of course we have the Accord Touring, the top end version, which is very similar to the signature Mazda 6 that we were driving this week. And in this trim, Honda has decided to go about things a little bit differently again than Mazda, because they'll let you choose either the 1.5 liter turbo or the 2 liter turbo in that same top end trim. Whereas on the Mazda side, you have to get the 2.5 liter turbo. Topping out at $35,800, it's about $1,000 more than the Mazda, and it won't have real wood trim on the inside. But the Honda will give you better 0-60 to performance, an adaptive suspension, better handling, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and a few other things that we just don't see in the Mazda. The user experience, I think, in terms of the way the infotainment system and the overall controls are laid out is a little bit better in the Honda as well, except for the shifter. I'm not a huge fan of that push-button shifter. In addition to that, we also get a bigger trunk and more legroom in the Honda. The interior arguably feels more modern, and I would actually say even more premium, despite the lack of real wood trim. Of course, that shouldn't be too surprising, since the Accord is a brand new model in this segment, and the Mazda has just been refreshed, but the basics of the vehicle are definitely older. The other recent entry in this segment is the all-new Toyota Camry, and the Camry really has gone from a very middle-of-the-road entry to an excellent competitor to the top-end sporty entries in this segment. Of course, my caveat there is as long as you can handle the exterior styling, because it is a little bit polarizing. The Camry is about the same price as the sport trim of the Mazda 6 with the automatic, and the active safety stuff is standard on the Camry. 
Even when you factor that into the Mazda 6, they end up about the same price again, however. The Camry is one of the options in this segment that still has a reasonable amount of rear headroom. So if you're looking for one of the better vehicles to carry taller people in the rear, the Camry is going to be one of the better options. Even though legroom scores are a little bit lower, headroom is higher, and that actually is a little bit more important in this mid-size sedan segment, because legroom is not a problem in really any of the entries, but headroom does get limited on some of the swoopier profiles that we're starting to see. Now, when we're talking about the V6, Toyota decided to keep that engine for premium versions only, so you'll have to shell out $34,550, unlike we see in the Honda or in the Mazda 6. So if you're simply looking for value performance, you will definitely get more performance for your dollar if you're looking for that base 2.5 liter T version of the Mazda versus the regular four-cylinder engine in the Camry. I think I like the overall styling inside the Mazda's cabin a little bit more, but I would actually say that the Camry's interior has slightly better parts quality depending on where you're looking inside the cabin. As with the Mazda, we don't find Apple CarPlay or Android Auto inside the Camry's cabin. Although I would actually expect it to happen inside the Camry before we see it inside the Mazda. The reason for that is that Toyota recently announced the Avalon and the Corolla hatchback with Apple CarPlay integration, so we should see Apple CarPlay at least coming to the Camry probably next year would be my guess. Next up we have the Kia Optima. The 2 liter engine in the Optima may be a little bit down on power versus the Mazda, but likely because of the turbo lag, the front wheel slip, and of course the overall tuning of the transmission, the Optima actually manages to be faster 0 to 60 in stock form. Kia's interior also feels a little bit more modern than the Mazda, and it does have a longer warranty. But I don't think the exterior of the Optima is as attractive as the Mazda, so I think the Optima has the more attractive interior, the Mazda has the more attractive exterior. As with the Accord, the Optima has the latest in smartphone integration technology, and it has a slightly more comfortable rear seat for taller folks than what we see in the Mazda. On the downside, the Kia may actually cost you more just to get into that 2-liter turbocharged engine. Comparably equipped, they end up kind of similarly priced. It depends on how much you want to factor in that extra warranty, of course, on the Kia side. But a fully loaded Optima will actually set you back more than a fully loaded Mazda 6. It can get up to nearly $36,000, although that does buy you what seems to be better leather inside the Optima's cabin, a snazzier sound system, rear window shades, and of course the better 0-60 to 60 performance. I think that road holding is actually slightly better in the Optima in that top end trim than the Mazda as well, because we do get wider tires in the Optima, and it doesn't weigh any more than the Mazda. On the downside, of course, with the Optima, you do have to give up fuel economy, because fuel economy is notably lower than the Mazda. With Ford's Fusion riding off into the sunset and the Altima due to be replaced soon, let's talk about the Passat. Volkswagen has been pretty aggressive with pricing on the Passat, and it actually starts lower than a comparable Mazda, and they've decided to make their 2.0-liter turbocharged engine standard. Although power on that 2.0-liter turbo is actually more similar to the Mazda 2.5-liter naturally aspirated engine than most of the competitors' 2.0-liter turbos. Based on that, you might be wondering why Volkswagen bothered to put a turbo on it in the first place, the main reason is drivability, the big reason that we also see the turbo in the top end trims of the Mazda 6. Where the Passat really excels is interior volume and of course aggressive dealer pricing. It has a very large and accommodating rear seat and a pretty big trunk that make it very handy for larger families. Of course if you want more oomph you can get Volkswagen's 3.6 liter VR6 in their new GT trim for a very low price as well. $29,145 actually manages to undercut the turbocharged Mazda 6's base price, and performance is considerably better. Now, it's not quite as good as we see in the new Camry and the Accord, but it is awfully close. On the downside, engagement, which used to be a Volkswagen hallmark, just isn't there at the same level as it used to be in previous Passats. It's also worth noting that the dual-clutch transmission that we find in the Passat is likely going to have higher long-term maintenance costs than most of the other entries in this segment. My bottom line in this segment is that the Camry and the Accord are still the two winners in this segment, especially if you're taking a look at the top-end trim, which is what we were looking at this week. Mazda has unquestionably made an absolutely gorgeous car even more attractive, but the engine, the handling ability, and the infotainment all let it down. And yes, that does include the new turbocharged engine. Again, you could fix the handling with wider, grippier tires, but it would still be slower 0-60 to 60 than the alternatives. Mazda really has focused on drivability and fuel economy with their new turbocharged engine, but it actually doesn't really exceed the Camry V6 or the Accord 2.0-liter turbo in those particular areas either. 
In addition to that, the infotainment system definitely still feels old school. So my recommendation would be, if you love the way the Mazda 6 looks, then definitely get it in this segment. I think it's a perfectly valid reason to buy the Mazda. But if we're talking about top picks or best overall winners, then it would clearly be the new Camry V6 or the new Accord 2 liter turbo. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. Be sure and hit that subscribe button down there. You'll also probably see a link down there if you wanna buy t-shirts with Alex and Auto's logos on them. You can also click up to the top if you wanna support this channel, you'll be taken over to patreon.com. And as always, find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos so you can see what I'm driving right now. I'll see you next week.